All right, I want to get in the Word. First Kings 17, we're talking about a thousand times more. Our theme scripture this month is Deuteronomy 1, 11. I'll read that a little bit later. But I want to read First Kings 17. I want to talk for just a few moments about a secret technology of increase. A secret technology of increase. Something that many people don't correlate. And I've read this story thousands of times. I've preached it, probably preached it this year more than once here at the Global Hub. But I saw something recently while preaching this text I had never seen in this light. First Kings 17 verses 7 through 16. It came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Now Ecclesiastes declares to everything there is a time and a season. Sometimes in your life the brook just dries up. It doesn't mean you're not with God. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean God doesn't like you. I remember when I was living in a city and working at a ministry and it seemed so right. And all of a sudden it just seemed to me like the brook dried up. My brook there dried up. They were good people, but it was a time and a season of transition. And so this is what happened to the prophet. The brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon. Dwell there, and behold, I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you. He arose and went to Zarephath, came to the gate. The widow was gathering sticks. He called and said, Fetch, I pray thee a little water, and that I may drink as she was going to fetch it. He called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in your hand. She said, As the Lord lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel, a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering of some sticks, uh, two sticks that I may go dress it for me my son that we may eat it and die and Elijah said unto her fear not go and do as thou hast said but make me thereof a cake first and bring it unto me after that make for thee and thy son and thus saith the Lord God of Israel the barrel of meal shall not waste neither shall the cruse of oil fail until the day of the Lord sending rain upon the earth she went and did according to the saying of Elijah she and he and her house did eat many days and the barrel of meal wasted not neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah now I want to break this down number one the man of God was in a place of obedience he had what I call a first word someone say a first word the first word is the word that positions you. But sometimes as you're in position, there comes a time and a season of the reposition. And the way that you walk into a thousand times more is you refuse stagnation. I don't want to be stagnant in my prayer life. I don't want to be stagnant in my spirit life. I don't want to be st See, some folks are just stagnant. This is one thing I think is so bad in the body of Christ that a move of God comes and then when a new move comes because it doesn't look like the last move we just sandbag it we try to tear it apart we say it's not of God we don't like it we need to be a people that can ride the wave of one move and when the new move comes we jump right on that new move and ride that wave that's how we're going to live in the place of a thousand times more listen God will send people that stretch you I remember going to Bible school in a, in a woman named Miss Louise my wife will remember Miss Louise Miss Louise said if God will give me a house I'll pray all night and so God gave Miss Louise a house and she went to the Bible school students about 170 of us proper in the building and began to ask who will pray with me all night and 168 of them because you got to include her and me said no and she came to me and said Ryan nobody will come and pray at my house but I told the Lord if you give me a house I'm going to make it a house of prayer well you see I understood that because I told the Lord if you give me a car I'm going to give people rides now I wouldn't advise this now but I used to pick people up that didn't have no ride and take them places I would see somebody in the Holy Ghost would say I pick them up and I, I'd try to tell the Lord no and the Lord said you said if I gave you a car you would give people some rides come on somebody and so I went to Miss Louise's house and we began to pray all night I never had been to a house to pray all night but God used her to stretch 
me. God sent a preacher into my life named Dave Roberson that would pray in tongues six to eight hours a day. I was doing good to pray 15 minutes a day. God used him to stretch me. God sent another lady preacher into my life that had the word of knowledge. And, and I said, I, I, I want that gift. And God used that lady preacher to stretch me. God has sent new people into my life uh, when I was coming into greater prophetic awareness to stretch me. The point I'm making to you is this. It's the first word that positions you, but it's the second word that stretches you. And sometimes the problem is you're stuck in a season. You're stuck in a, in a lifestyle. You're stuck with a people that is not the place of the thousand times more for you. And Elijah found himself at a place where the brook had dried up. Now most of us, we can't hear from God when the brook dries up. I preached last night in Detroit on faith because I said I'm concerned about this generation. We judge our services by what we feel. We judge our messages by who shouted. We judge our ministries by likes and shares and follows. But many of us don't understand raw faith. Raw faith goes out and steps out with no feeling. Raw faith believes God when it doesn't feel anything. Do you know of all the miracles in the Bible, there are, there are almost none that deal with people's feelings. Most miracles, somebody just believed God. And faith alone pulled something from Jesus or whoever was ministering. And they were healed. But now we got to have the right music. We got to have the right atmosphere. We got to have the right kind. I don't like loud preaching. And then we can't get the miracle because we don't like the loud preacher. I, I like teaching. And so if they're not teaching, we can't get in. Uh, some will say, I don't want to listen to teaching. It's boring to me. I want them to shout. I want their veins to pop out. But sometimes the teacher's got something that you need to hear. But the problem is we are stuck in a space and a place that is limiting the move of God in our lives. And so then we don't feel God. The brook dries up and we don't feel God. You ever notice with folk that they were shouting on Sunday and then when a bill came that they didn't have the provision for on Monday, they lost everything they shouted about on Sunday got called to be a prophet on Sunday and on Monday the light bill came and oh my God I didn't realize it was going to be this high and I don't have enough money and now they're cursing and cussing and they I don't even act like they're saved and they were going to be called a prophet on Sunday. What happens is we move by our feelings and so Elijah paused. God I know you told me to be here but the brook has dried up. It's interesting because most of us, we would have went looking for a prophetic word. This is the problem is we're looking for what we should be presenting. We're looking, but we've been saved for years, but we still need somebody to encourage. And, and we need encouragement. Don't get me wrong. But we need somebody. You know, I know preachers that if they get done preaching and five people don't high five them and tell them how amazing they are. They're so mad and angry and defeated and discouraged. But a real leader is able to be self-motivated and move forward in spite of a lack of response or a lack of high fives. And Elijah got the word of the Lord. Listen, sometimes you just got to sit there that brook is dried up and you got to say God I need to hear from you God I need you to speak to me God I know that something is out of alignment I'm not sure what it is I feel like I'm doing what you told me to do but God what is it sometimes God's going to tell you to do something else but I cannot tell you sometimes God's going to tell you, you just need to wait on me so Elijah gets a second word go to Zidon now, you need to study Zidon. Zidon was an ungodly place. Zidon was the place, the part of the territory that Jezebel came from. Study it out. And so the man of God is being told, I want you to go to an ungodly place. There I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you. Wait a minute, God. First you had a raven. A raven is an unclean bird. I'm a Jewish man and I'm supposed to be eating the right things and you're sending an unclean bird. God said, when I want to get a thousand times more in your life, I will use somebody that doesn't know Jesus. I will use somebody that doesn't believe in preaching. I will never forget when I needed a television crew and I couldn't find any Christians. So I found, so well, the guy was a Christian. He was a Presbyterian. 
but I found some people that were work for ESPN2. And I said, I need to hire you. They told me their rate. I said, I could give you one quarter of that. It's all I got. And they came to work for me. And, and they didn't understand tongues. And they didn't understand prophecy. They didn't understand none of that. But I remember meeting in their boardroom after they were working for me several months. And the owner of the company said, I just I don't understand this. But since I've started helping you, my business is increasing. I said, because God is on my side. And when you touch my life, you are touching God. And when you touch God, you can't help but get blessed. I remember I needed a, a, a producer to help me. And I got a message. You remember I was on satellite television that time. I got a message from a producer, a Catholic man from Los Angeles, that I produced this movie and that movie, that movie. said, the quality of what you're producing is horrible, but I feel God when you're preaching. I want to help you. And the man began to help me. God will oftentimes send you somewhere that doesn't make any sense. I had a friend, my friend, Dr. LaDonna Taylor. I should bring her sometime, but she was the violinist for the late Morris Cirillo, and she was a violinist for Pastor Benny Hinn. She was, uh, years ago, the organ player at the late John Osteen's church, and uh, LaDonna has ministered all over the world. She's a classically trained musician of the great symphonies of the world, and uh, I had not seen LaDonna for years, and uh, LaDonna came to a meeting. LaDonna was always talented, but was, she came to this meeting and began to play, and as Dr. Taylor began to play, People started to get healed. I never saw anything like it. She'd say, uh, your death, come stand here. And she would play. La Dr. LaDonna wears these flowing, uh, it just looks like what a violinist should wear, these flowing custom dresses. And she plays and she twirls around the person playing. And they get healed while she's twirling around them. It's a very unusual ministry. And I, sa I said afterwards, I said, LaDonna, I need to talk to you. She said, what is it? I said, there's something on you that wasn't on you the last time I saw you. I need to find out what happened. She said, well, Ryan, I went and worked for a Saul. I worked for probably the most nasty, mean-spirited, difficult person I've ever worked for. But it pushed me into a time of consecration and prayer. She said, I feel like God put me in a space to learn everything not to do. Let me help you tonight. God, some of you wonder, why did I go through what I went through? Because you were learning what not to do. You were learning how not to lead people. You were learning how not to treat people. You were learning how not to pray for people. You were learning how not to abuse people. And if you're honest with yourself, in that season, it caused a push in your spirit that did not come any other way. And so the thing you've got to learn to do instead of fretting about where you've been, you've got to tap into a Romans 8, 27, 28, that God caused all things to work together for your good. It was a season of training. God said, Elijah, go to Zidon. I don't want to go to Zidon. It's amazing. You don't hear preachers going to San Francisco, California and planting a church. Hardly anybody wants to go to Seattle, Washington and plant a church. Why? Because they're sleepy. It's cold. People don't really think about Jesus. But sometimes you got to go to Zidon to get your thousand times more. And so he sends them to Zidon, the area Jezebel was from, an area that was ruled by Baal worship. Elijah sent there and finds the woman and said, can you give me a cake? The woman says, I don't have enough, sir, to give you anything because I'm about to make my last meal for my boy and die. I don't know about you, but if I'm in Jezebel's home area, in her territory, everybody's worshiping Baal, and the God of Israel told me to go to a wicked territory that a lady's going to provide for me, and now I'm talking to the woman, and the woman says, all I got is enough to eat and die. I would either think I missed it or I'd be angry with God if I didn't think I missed it. But can I tell you, when the word of the Lord hits your spirit, and you do what God said, increase will come out of nowhere multiplication will come out of nowhere can i tell you this thousand times more it's not just about you it's about your children it's about the people in your family you want to bless the reason god wants to get something to you is because he wants to bless everybody around you and god wanted to bless this woman why so that the man of god could be blessed i don't know how many different people we've prayed with many 
that have become millionaires. In the last six weeks, two people in my network, their ministries have received over $1 million each. I was preaching at Apostle Charlie Howe's church, and I was raising an offering, and I really felt the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, when I first started going to that territory, you could have a, a lot of people and always a tiny offering. And I told Apostle Charlie, we're not going to accept the climate of this territory. We're going to push people in the means. I said, when I start to receive the offering and I feel resistance, I'm going to just get my foot right to where the resistance is at, and I'm going to stand right there. And I'm just going to keep on pushing and keep on pushing because we're going to break down something in this area. And so one of our tribe network members in tribe now, they were not at that time. They've got a church, but they, 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 they're very prolific humanitarians. They've worked with presidents and government officials, and uh, they, they, they have a nonprofit and, and receive grant nation and all those sorts of things. And so they were in the building, and God spoke to the woman of God and said, you need to sow $200. And she looked, and she didn't have any, any way to sow. And she told her daughter-in-law, do you have a checkbook? Do you have something? Yeah, I've got a checkbook. Write a $200 check. I'll pay you back. And so she wrote that $200 check that night. And within days, I got a report from them and said, Apostle, we sowed that check that night. And when we sowed that check within days, $2 million of grant funding was released into our corporation. So many times we've seen those miracles. God wants to get something to you to bless everybody around you. Elijah told the woman, fear not. I don't want you to be afraid. Why? Because fear will always keep you out of the more. I don't know who in this building has ever sown a $100 seed, probably the majority. If so, do you ever remember the first time you did it? Then if you've sown a $1,000 seed, oh, Lord, that will shake you. I remember we sowed recently a $30,000 seed. I said, my God, my God. That shook me. And we sowed it to one person. They said, thank you. But somehow thank you just didn't seem sufficient for a $30,000. Like, I, I need a card. Like, take me out to lunch. Like, just thank you. Like, praise the Lord. Come on. You know you would think that way. I remember when $30,000 was a year income, and now God's putting a $30,000 seed through us to somebody. <laughs> oh, my God, my God, a thousand times more. So Elijah says, go and do what you're saying. Watch this now. Fear not, go and do what you said, but make me there the cake first and bring it unto me. And after that, make one for your boy and for you. And I saw something in here I never saw before. I understood the prophetic components that when God sends prophetic people into your life, the word of the Lord will pull you out of poverty. It'll pull you out of depression. It'll pull you out of fear. It'll pull you out of bondage. I understood that part of the story that the prophet had multiplication in his mouth. This is why we can't go around cursing folk when we get mad. We can't be loose with our lips. Why? Because our mouth is filled with power in the realm of the spirit and we can't put our mouths on people that God has put his hand on I understood that but I missed something in this story I missed this reality that the miracle came to the woman as she served and the spirit of God said to me there is an underemployed technology of increase and it's called serving See, we are living in a generation where everybody wants a name. People don't come to me, Jasmine, and say, will you pray for me to serve? People come to me and say, will you pray for me to write a book? Will you pray for me to get discovered? Will you pray for me to get a door open? I don't know how many times in my network, how many times in ministry, how many times in the church I've heard folks say, I got to leave because they're not receiving my gift. I got to go somewhere. I've seen folk interview the pastor before they joined the church. 
Well, I'm a prophet. I was a prophet at my last church. Let me help you. Just because you were a prophet at your last church doesn't mean you're a prophet at your new church. Why? Because they need to inspect you. They need to uh, authenticate you. They need to verify you. Come on, somebody. But oftentimes I've seen folk do an interview. I want to make sure if I join your church that I get on the prophecy. Really, they're saying, I want to have a microphone. I don't want to just come and carry a towel. I don't want to come and pour water. But the woman did not get multiplication in her life by getting on a stage, by getting on a platform. But the woman got multiplication in her life as she began to serve. And I believe one of the areas the devil has breached in the spirit is he's created a prideful generation of Christians that we don't want to serve anymore. We don't value serving. We value being served. We deem our giftedness. And let me just say this. When you truly serve, you don't have to promote that you serve. You don't have to tell everybody. I, I, I saw a preacher one time. No, nobody, I'm throwing shade. I just, it stood out to me. It said, I'm so humble, I carried my own bag. I said, the fact, the fact you're saying that to me is a problem to me. See, we don't have to make a post. Look how I, oh, I just served. You know, nobody was at the door. So I just held the door at the church. We don't have to make a post about that. You're losing your blessing doing it that way. You got to be able to serve when nobody sees you. See, there's things that I do nobody knows about. There's bills I've paid for people nobody knows about. There's prayers I prayed for people nobody knows about. There's prophecies I've given to people nobody knows about. And, and the thing is, sometimes God will send you on an un undercover serving operation that you don't even like the people. There's some folk I don't even like them. And God told me, you need to serve them. You need to help them. There's some folk that made me mad that I want to curse them. I want to do a Facebook Live and put their name in it and tag them. And the Lord would tell me sow a seed into them bless them serve them I, I remember there was a, a wicked lady that was opposing me in the last state I lived in and this lady I mean I, I told her off I did not cuss but I told her off in a sanctified way I told her off and shook my finger in her face because I was trying to put up a tent and she was blocking me from putting up the tent and I got back to my office and I felt good I told her off I didn't feel bad I felt good about it and I got back and sat at my desk and the Holy Ghost said, I don't like what you did to that woman. I want you to order her a dozen roses. I said, the devil is a liar. He said, I want you to order a dozen roses. I went to my wife, said, God just told me something that made me so mad. She said, what? I said, God told me to apologize to that woman and send her a dozen roses. I did it, and I got a phone call. I didn't do it for the phone call. I did it because God said to do it. And the phone call was, was, you know what, Pastor? I got those roses, and I feel bad about what happened. I'll do whatever. You can actually come put your tent up on my land. I'll give you the electricity for your tent. I'll do whatever you need. Listen, because God told me to serve. I did not want to serve that woman, but God told me to serve. We forget the art of serving. The Bible says this. The Bible said about Jesus that Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Ministry is not about an airplane. Ministry is not about an honorarium. Ministry is not about a great Instagram photo with your favorite preacher. Ministry is about rolling your sleeves up and serving. It's about doing what needs to be done. It's about sometimes doing it and you don't even get any reward. I used to get upset. My spiritual mother, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ronnie Birch, she is a doctor. I gave her an uh, honorary doctorate from our institute. I used to get upset because she was the most godly person I ever knew. But she didn't mount platforms very often. She was not a preacher. She was a prayer. So even when she preached, people didn't always like her preaching because she'd start praying and she'd pray for 45 minutes before she ever said anything. She'd start talking to Jesus and forget everyone was there and everyone be waiting like when she and she was just unusual. And I would get mad because I found oftentimes in the church culture, we're not very nice to people that we don't deem as important. And God had to deal with my heart because God told me when she gets to heaven, son, her reward is there. She did not live her life for here. 
And I believe Jesus was trying to point out to us, we are not called to live our lives for here. I want, it's, it's a great story in the Bible. And we can all shout an amen because the woman got her, her the, the, the oil multiplied and the meal multiplied. And the Bible said she ate many days. She received the prophet. She received the word of the Lord. And we could preach about how if you open up to the prophetic, it'll bring increase in your life. But the depth of this story is found in serving. The woman received a command, not a request. She received a command. You can do what you said, but God said, before you do it, woman, go and bake me a cake. Some women would get mad just because the man said, bake me a cake. I heard a young preacher. I think he's on here. One of my sons, he was preaching about how women should do this. But I said, he's not married yet. (laughs) He gets married. That sermon will change. It'll go right out the window. See, you bow before you're married. You get married, you have a brand new perspective. You knew it had to be God for the man of God to to say that to the woman. But she served. Multiplication hit every area of her life because she served. Sometimes in the church, we have to do things with people and for people that irritate every fiber of our being. Sometimes... We have to love people we don't like. Sometimes we have to close our mouth when we know that if we opened it, there'd be there'd be a body count. Even when they're talking about us, I remember I was going to Bible college and and I had gone into business with this couple. And I thought that everybody that because I was nobody in my family was in ministry. I, I thought everybody that said they were saved was nice and kind and loved God. But this couple was filled with demons. And so uh, the, uh, they, uh, they were in a business with us, and we began to have some issues with them. And they were in the office of the dean and director of students, and they were cursing me, <coughs> accusing me. And it was brought to my attention. They're in there right now trying to get you kicked out of Bible school. So I said, I'm going to the office right now. And the Lord said to me, don't go to that office. Do not defend yourself. I said, but God, they're lying on me. And God said, if you'll remain silent about those lies, I will defend you. And I had to sit there not knowing would I even get kicked out of Bible school, which is what they were trying to do. But the Holy Ghost said, I'm your defender. And so I just sat there and I was quiet. I want you to know the couple got a divorce. I want you to know that they fell into financial distress. I want you to know they got expelled out of Bible college. I want you to know that I went on to become the youngest administrator in the history of that Bible college. But I did not defend myself. I served my way into what God had for me. I didn't want to administrate the Bible college. I did not want to preach. I did not want to pastor. I did not want to do apostolic work. I wanted to live my life and put money in the offering and praise God. But God said, I've called you to another life. When Joy and I were going to get married, my, one of my leaders sat her down. Said, before you get married, you need to understand this. You're not marrying a normal person. Your life will never be normal. Your life will be a life that doesn't look like other people's lives. And I thank God for that conversation because if we got married and the understanding was you're going to buy me a house and we're going to just have a white picket fence and work a nine to five, she would have been miserable forever because I've spent uh, a lot of my life in other nations going to places on late nights. There's times that I'll travel that we'll be texting. I'll say, I'll call you after service. And after service, I get held up by the pastor. I'm not in my room till 1 a.m. And we didn't get to talk that night. But we signed up to serve. We signed up to serve. And a good preacher or teacher understands even this is serving. This is not self-exalting. This is not brand-building. This is serving the people of God. And unfortunately, our pulpits are vacated of the art of serving. Serving. I ask the Lord, Lord, as we build this hub, help me. No matter what you do, how large it gets, however many other hubs we're building, what we're doing. If I'm walking out and one person finds me and needs prayer and I'm supposed to pray for them and I'm exhausted, give me the strength to pray for them. Let me be lovable, Lord. Let me be teachable. Let me be touchable. Let me be somebody that encourages your people. 
I remember praying for promotion. And then promotion came. And I remember going on a trip and said, I got to preach. Oh, I got to go preach. And I was complaining about preaching. And the Lord rebuked me. said, I want you to stop saying that. You need to say, I get to preach because you're working for me, son. Remember when nobody was inviting you. I remember sitting at my desk with stacks of papers because I'd ask my staff, print out the invitation. And there's one year of invitations coming in a month. And say, I can't go to all these places. Look at what you've done, Lord. And I remember one time going, taking an invitation because I had two the same day. And this one was little, a little honorarium, a little group of people here. And this one was big. And I felt something in my belly say, don't go to the big one. But my head said, this is a better opportunity. And I went to the big one. And it was when I was preaching, it was like chewing chalk. And I said, God, what is wrong? He said, I never told you to be here. You looked at the opportunity and you went for the opportunity. But Ryan, you got to pay your bills. I have never paid my bills exclusively from a preaching salary. I've paid my bills supernaturally and entrepreneurially. And yes, I've been paid on staff and ministry, but people would laugh if they knew my salary most of the time. Why? Because I wasn't in it for that. We've got to be servants. We've got to learn the art of serving. Jesus said, you're going to find your life when you lose it. In Matthew 20, he said, the last shall be first and the first last. Many are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen. It's the process of serving. What was it that positioned this woman for the miracle? The thousand times more. It was the prophet of God said, I want you to serve. That's what he was saying. Bake me a cake. That's serving. Take something you don't have and give it. That's serving. And not only that, but on your way to do it, fear not. Don't have a bad attitude about it. It contradicts what you want to do. It contradicts your mind, your thoughts, your understanding. I remember going to preach for one of the people on our network and their 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 service they have a very long worship that's how their church was started and they said uh apostle this mega church pastor came and preached and said your church is never going to grow if you do worship that long what do you think and i said i think what he's telling is what he understands and it's true in the context of what he's advising you but i want to ask you this question what did god tell you to do he said, God told me that the worship was the driving force of our church. I said, are you okay if you have 500 people and not 5,000? He said, yes. Are you okay if your tenacity for worship limits the number of people that can come on that level with you? Yes. See, one way we miss serving is we serve somebody else's identity and not our own. And when the man of God let go of that, God began to bless his ministry, give him other buildings, other campuses. And what the mega church pastor told him was proven false because he served what God said and not what the man told him. Everybody's trying to be great. The greatest posture in the kingdom is surrender. That's why the Holy Ghost had us surrendering tonight. That's the posture. That's the attitude. That's the blessing. So many times... When God has told me to do things, it scared me. It scared me. I remember standing in front of a girl with no eyeball in her head. And God said, tell her she'll see. And tell the crowd on the microphone. I remember preaching in India in a house meeting where the tsunami had killed thousands of people. And I was preaching to a bunch of Hindus in a house meeting because this feeding ministry had fed them throughout the calamity. And God said to me, they're not going to believe anything you preach, only what I do. And I told them, I'm going to pray for every deaf person. How many of you are deaf? And a bunch of reasons. I'm going to pray for you. And if your ears don't open, the God that I'm talking about is not real. But if, if what I'm saying is real, that God, Jesus, will open your ears. It scared me in my mind when that came out of my mouth. But it came from my spirit. It was serving. And when I prayed that day, every set of ears opened. It wasn't a dramatic prayer. It wasn't a long prayer at all. I just prayed, and then I said, who can hear? And they began to hear. And all those Hindus in that house, every single one of them accepted Jesus that day. Why? Because I was serving. Yes, you're going to be great, but be found great in the posture of serving. 
So many people are missing what's in front of them today because they're focused on unfulfilled ambition. Give me five more minutes and I'll be done with this. This woman was at the point of death. She needed a breakthrough in a major way. And the way God delivered the breakthrough, hear what I'm about to say, is God said, you serve somebody else's vision, somebody else's ministry, somebody else's dream, and I will take care of your whole family. So many of us wonder, why is my thing not taking off? Because you're not facilitating a vision bigger than yours. You're not involved with a purpose bigger than yours. The man of God had a flow over his life. And when she served under that flow, it brought multiplication to her. Say it again. The man of God had a flow over his life. And when she served under that flow, it brought multiplication to her. I believe tonight God is opening your understanding to the secret technology of multiplication. It's called serving. Our text scripture this month is Deuteronomy 111. May the Lord God of your fathers increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. I want to give a challenge to every viewer. God is asking to upgrade your level of service in the kingdom. Will you be a towel carrier? Will you carry a towel? What if that's all God asks you to do for 20 years? Just carry a towel. But I'm called to be a prophet. You'll get there. Just carry a towel. I'm called to be an apostle. You'll get there. Just carry a towel. This is the thing that shocks me. People can't be faithful carrying a towel. And they think God's going to let them carry nations. If you can't obey an instruction to carry a towel, how could you carry nations? Carry a towel. When I served my spiritual father, Dr. Hayes, this is how I prayed when I first started serving him. God, when he starts to get thirsty, let me know it before he says it. Let me have the water up there before. I was the head usher, and I told the ushers, we're going to pray, and we're going to discern the demons that come in the building. And when we see demonized people, they're to sit in the back. We've already discerned it and watching them. We're going to make sure nothing goes wrong. When the prayer line gets going, we're going to discern. Is he going to start praying down here or down here? Who's going to fall? Who's not? We're going to discern it. I told them the same anointing there is to preach and to prophesy, there is to serve. And if God can train you to serve well, he can trust you to serve more. And that's where the increase comes in your life. I was praying the other day, and I want to say something very transparent, and I'm not taking shots, but it's the truth of my heart. Just so many things recently I've been involved in and seen where people are fighting over people. There's 7.9 billion people on planet Earth. There are people who've never heard the name of Jesus, and we are fighting. And I cannot for the life of me, and I've probably done it at times, so, but I cannot understand this concept that we think we own people, like their possessions. And I was in prayer, and I was wrestling with some of this. And the Lord said to me, son, I want you to go back to the very first elementary things I called you to do. I said, well, we're building this hub, the ATL hub. He said, but I want you to win the loss. I texted a guy in my network and said, for my birthday in the month of February, I want to have a soul winning crusade. Can you find me a building in your city? I texted one of my preacher friends and said, I believe you have a mandate of revival. When I get the, a building, will you come and preach this crusade with me? Then I called another friend of mine who for years worked for R.W. Schambach, and he has a, a, a very wonderful company. And I said, you've been a crusade coordinator. I want to go to some nations this next year. Tell me which ones are open for mass crusades. I want to go, and I want to win the loss. He said, Ryan, the greatest nation that people are getting saved left and right now is Pakistan. I just preached for Pakistan. I know a great leader in Pakistan. I preached there via Zoom to a small crusade of a few hundred people. But he calls, asked me, can I FaceTime with you? I FaceTime with them. And he said, will you? He said, we're coming into our winter, but there's an area. Let me make sure I don't tell this wrong. He said, there's an area where for 27 years the gospel has not been preached in that place. And he said, if we can get you before the end of November to do a Zoom crusade, we will try to get several thousand people to hear about Jesus. You preach Jesus, get them saved. I said, give me a date. He said, November 27th. I said, I'll do it. What do I need to do? 
He said, I need you to sponsor Bibles. He said, we're going to believe at least 1,500 people get saved out of the several thousands. So I need you to buy 1,500 Bibles, Urdu Bibles. That's their language. Six dollars a piece. This is the largest, second largest Muslim nation in the world. Now, the other thing is my crusade director that I'm hiring said, Ryan, I just took a pastor that's a friend of mine there, and 50,000 people were saved in one meeting. Will you go? I said, I will go, but Mrs. Lestrange has to sign off on it because I had a chance to go a couple years ago, and she, this is the only nation. She said, I don't want you to go, but they tell me they will have 2,000 security people, and, and I will be taken care of. It cannot be advertised, but at the appointed time, I will go. The Lord said to me, I want you to get back to winning souls. I want you to get back to the elementary things. I want you to serve me. There is multiplication in our serving. And I feel that the spirit of surrender that blew through this place. And if you're just now joining online, you need to go and rewatch the beginning. God did something special tonight.